Uh, repeat the top with me today. Please say courageous, courageous. Priorities. priorities. Come on again. Say courageous, courageous. Priorities. priorities. Today we talk about how much time you have. How much time do you have? In our study, we've been looking at how a group of people in the book of Esther managed a crisis. It was an amazing story about priorities. The word priority simply means what you do first. It's the word, root word prior. Decide in your life what goes first. Decide in your life what you do last, and you'll change your life. In our study this year, we've been saying that if you want to change your life, you've got to have courageous conversations, and in those courageous conversations, you come to a list of changes you want to make and need to make in your life in order for your life to go forward. Once you come to that summary of changes you need to make, then you need, then you need a plan. The plan will then require that you have resources. You need money. You need people. You need wealth. You need some kind of wealthy resource to help you implement your plan. Because you're clear about the changes you need because you had a courageous conversation with yourself or whoever's involved in your life, and you're clear, I need to make these changes. So these are my plans. This person is who I'll go to for advice. This is, where I, this is how much money I'll need to make these changes in my life. I need to rearrange my whole life. And once I set in my mind the changes, once I set the resources in my hand, once I get them in my hand, I must then establish priorities. Say that word again. Come on. If I don't establish priorities, I'll waste the wealth. I'll waste all the advice I've received. There are a lot of people who decided, I need to go to school, I need to get an education, I need to, I need to, I need to. So they, they change their schedule, they go to school, they plan it all out, they get the money to go, they go to school, and then they allow everything to distract them. You went through all that effort, and now you're not making it a priority. You went through all that effort to get a job, to get money, and now... <laughs> You're wasting the money. That's because your priorities aren't right. You, you prioritize getting a good husband or a good wife, and now they're not a priority. It's amazing. The very thing you work so hard to get. And, and I'm telling you, it's a trap. It's a trap that we all face. And in the book of Esther, you see it. You see it unfold because what you learn when you look at this book you should learn five profound things. Number one, the power of definition. Say that with me, please. Come on. How you define things determine what you prior, how you prioritize things. If you define preaching as an event to inspire people and you've got to always be on the top of the roof and, and getting everybody yelling at you, that's what you'll go after because that's a priority to you. I have not preached until you fall down. And I'll hold you here for four hours until you fall down. Because that's a priority to me. My priorities are determined by my definition. Secondly, power of values. What you value, what's important to you is a priority. What are your, what I call, non-negotiable life rules? These are the things I will not change. These are the things I will not do no matter what happens. Then once you've established your values... That impacts your goals. Your goals, you see, <laughs> that summarizes what you're trying to do. So what am I trying to do as a pastor? What are my goals? More people? Bigger buildings only? There's value in that. We'll talk about that another time. But, but that is, what's the goal in the building? What's the goal? And once I establish the goal, timetables. Timetables are crucial because if I set a goal without a timetable, <laughs> okay, so I want to go to California in a day. Okay, uh, that's my goal, but uh, I'm planning on riding a bike. No, no, I need to fly. That's the only way I can get there. And so in our study today, we're going to look at timetables because here's what's going to happen. Because of some distorted priorities in the life of a guy named Haman, because of his view of the world, and because of a crisis in Esther's life, and Mordecai's life, these are names you'll hear about in a minute, they are facing a time crunch. There are different goals they're facing. Well, they have one goal, really. Haman has a goal, and so does Esther and Mordecai. Haman's goal is to kill all the Jews. 
Mordecai and Esther are trying to stop that from happening. And they've got a date, certain. 13th of Adar is called, 13th of March. That's the date for all the Jews to be killed in one day. All this is a horrible problem, but the clock is ticking. And as the clock is ticking, decisions have to be made. If you don't respond to this clock, 13th of Adar is coming. How did they get to this place? Well, pretty simple. Let me give you a little background if you're new to the story. The book of Esther is about a woman whose name was Esther, whose mother and father died. She was basically cared for by a cousin. His name was Mordecai. Mordecai took her in and raised her up like a daughter. What an amazing story of how a guy can raise a girl and do a good job. This whole idea that you need both parents is nice, but sometimes that's not how it works out. And I believe that God can anoint you. Can you say amen to that? Amen. So Mordecai raises this girl. Now, that's amazing. Can you imagine doing the hair, having the little teenage talks? He raises her up, and she eventually has an amazing life turn. Let me slide another guy into this picture. She eventually becomes queen because an amazing thing happens in the, queen, in the king's life. He's married to a woman named Vashti. The king's name is Assyria. He's a Persian guy. And he is married to this queen named Vashti, and he gets really high, has this big party in chapter 1 of Esther. And he's partying, and he says, bring my woman out here. I want everybody to see how pretty she is. And he says, put your crown on, baby. Come show everybody how you look. And Vashti says, I'm not coming. And so because of that, they fire Vashti. She's no longer queen, and they look for a new queen in chapter 2 of Esther, in the book of Esther. And so in chapter 2, they find, guess who? Esther. And Esther becomes queen. Pretty good idea. Pretty proud man. Mordecai has now seen his little girl grow up to be queen. That's pretty cool. And what does he do? Mordecai hangs out at the gate. That's my, that's my raise, though, you know. It's a good life. Now, there's a guy who slides into the story. His name is Haman. Can you say Haman? Haman, Haman works for the king. And Haman gets a promotion, an amazing promotion. The king likes him, promotes him. He becomes this incredibly influential guy. And in chapter 3, this is the guy who is at the top of his game. He is wealthy. He's a multimillionaire. He is amazingly happy with life. He's got a wife and friends. And he walks through the city, and the king told everybody to do this now. When he walks by, honor him and bow. And Mordecai loved it. I'm sorry, Haman loved it. But there was one dude, one guy who wouldn't bow. Guess who that was? Mordecai. And, and we, you know, when you read the Bible, he, he says why. He said, because I'm a Jew. Now, that's all he said. Okay, now, that's not really a good reason because he didn't tell you to worship him. He just give honor to whom honor is due. There was nothing wrong with this bowing and showing honor. But Mordecai said, I'm not doing it. And now, hear this now. Haman didn't see him. So when Haman would walk by, everybody would bow but Mordecai. So his friends told him, hey, Haman, did you see that guy? Everybody bows when you come by but one man. His name is Mordecai. So they went to Mordecai, tried to talk to him, said, look, why don't you just honor the man and bow? He said, I'm not doing it. I'm not, I'm not doing it. Now, there's no reason given in the Bible for him not doing it. And you could argue that this was ridiculous. This set in motion a lot of things. You ever seen people just won't do right? They're good people, but they're stubborn. There's, there's no indication he's not a good guy. He just, he got this thing, I'm not bound. Now, now you could have had a moment where Haman talked to him or something, but no, no, Haman, Haman said, you know what? He won't bow. So you can see Haman say, I'm going to go back by and see myself. Let me see if he's going to bow. Uh-huh, he didn't bow. And all of a sudden, <laughs> he made a decision. He made an incredible decision. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill him. And I'm not just going to kill him. I'm going to kill all of his people. Everybody. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. It's one thing to be offended. It's another thing to be extreme. It's one thing to say, you know, I'm the boss and everybody should respond to me a certain way. And, and, and then it's another thing to just go in and just be brutal. Well, this was the result of an amazing problem, or this caused rather amazing problem, that eventually would cause rage to spread throughout the whole nation. Now watch this. Haman's rage spread. 
throughout the nation. 127 provinces are going to be impacted because here's what's going to happen. Haman goes to the king. He's so mad with this guy Mordecai, and he says, listen, there's one guy. No, he didn't say the guy. He said, there's, there's a people that doesn't show you honor. There's a people that won't do right. And he gives the king the spill. We, we ought to kill them all. As a matter of fact, he said, I'll pay for it. The king doesn't ask any questions. Assyrius doesn't ask any questions. He basically gives the guy permission. So he sends a letter to all the provinces and says, on the 13th of Adar, 13th of March, we're going to kill all the Jews. It's called Kill All Jews Day. Now, now think about this for a minute. One man's anger. So here's the question. Where has your anger spread? You don't like your sister. You don't like your cousin. You don't like your mama. You don't like somebody. How many people in your family have bought into your rage? They don't even know why you don't like them. But there's somehow this tradition now of resistance to getting along. He is enraged. And watch this. His rage has spread from India to Ethiopia. His rage has caused the entire community to become hostile toward the Jews. His rage is expensive. This is not in your notes. Write this down. Chapter 3, verse 9. In chapter 3, verse 9, the king, he tells the king, hey, listen, uh, it will probably cost about 10,000 talents to kill all these people. That's about 750 pounds of silver or millions of dollars. And he says, I'll pay for it. In chapter 3, verse 9, amazing. I'll pay for it. So here's a rich guy who's mad because somebody won't bow. He's amazingly frustrated. His rage causes panic for one year in the whole nation. Everybody, all the Jews, you see this in a minute, they're screaming and yelling. It's amazing. His rage forced the Jews eventually, though, to have to defend themselves. But here's what's going to happen. Later on in chapter 9, verse 16, the king is going to turn all of this around. Later on, the king is going to rescind this order to kill all the Jews. But remember, now, there's 100 and how many provinces? 127. So you send off 127 horsemen, right? There's no email. There's no e-blast. There's no way to communicate. Once you say it, it's said. So when he changed his mind, it was too late to fix it. You ever did something you can't fix it? You ran out of time? He had, he had months to change his mind. He had months to say this is foolish, he had, but he didn't. What he does is he waits, and now when he changes his mind, it's too late. And at the end of the story, 75,000 people get killed. All because one man was angry. The power of one person. Here's the question. Are you that person? Your rage, your anger, your frustration has long left your heart and spread out to your family. Spread out to your neighbors and friends, employees, employers. Spread out to your country. It's amazing how in this country, tone changes everything. Come on, say amen. The power that we have as leaders we impact the tone of everything. This man has changed the tone of a nation, not the king. The king didn't ask the right questions. He should have asked the question. Eventually, he finds out. But what's amazing is he could have stopped it at the beginning. He could have said, now, that's ridiculous to kill all the people because of one guy. But he didn't. How many times have you seen in the house? Strife between siblings go, gets out of control because parents say, don't let me come in there. You better work it out. Maybe you should go in there. Maybe you should help mediate. Maybe you should ask more questions. How could this one man's rage cause this much damage? Well, it did, my friend. It was awful. How much time do you have to establish the right priorities before you do something you can't repair. Haman had time, but his priority was his pride, and he ran out of time. You'll see in a minute. Look at the impact of, of Haman's priorities and the timeline challenges he created. First of all, Haman started a clock he could not stop. Say that with me, please. Come on. Haman started a clock he could not stop. 
Look at verse 13 of Esther chapter 3. And the letters were sent by the couriers into all the king's provinces to destroy all, to kill, and to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, little children. Look at that, little children, babies, infants, women. In how many days? One day. On the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, or March, and to plunder their possessions. So imagine all year long you're hearing people say, hey, next, I'm coming to get your stuff. It's going to be <laughs> 13th of Adar. I'm going to get you VCR and everything else, TV. I'm coming to get everything you got. Now, imagine people are waiting for this day. Oh, I like that horse. I'm going to take that horse on the 13th. Everybody now is aimed in this one direction. Secondly, notice Haman started a nation grieving. He could not stop. Chapter 4, verse 3. And in every province, when the king's command and, and, and decree arrived, there was a great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. That was a way of saying how, how grieved you were. Imagine all of this took place because of one man. We're really two. One who wouldn't bow and one who was extreme. Sometimes two people can make a big mess. Number three, Haman started his family down a road. He could not stop. Listen to this, Exodus, Esther chapter 5, verse 9. So Haman went out that day joyful with a glad heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, and that he did not stand or tremble before him, he did not do what? Stand or tremble before him. He was filled with indignation against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home. And he sent and called for his friends and his wife. Now, this is important because whenever he was in a bad mood, he would call a meeting. His friends and his wife would come together and they would all sit around and talk. And his, listen, listen to this guy's comments. This is interesting. Verse 11. Haman told them of his great riches. He starts off by talking about how wealthy he is. I got a lot of money. I want all of you to know I'm filthy rich. I am loaded. <laughs> then I got a multitude of children. Look at that. Come here. One, two, three. Here, five, six. A bunch of them. <laughs> Everything in which the king has promised, promoted me. And how he has advanced him above the officials. That's what he talked about. And the servants of the king. Moreover, Haman said, besides all of that, Queen Esther has invited no one but me to come in with the king to the banquet that she prepared. I'll talk about that later. And that's tomorrow. I am again invited by her along with the king. Yet all this avails me. What? Nothing. So long as I see Mordecai, I, the Jew, sitting at the king's gate. That's what's making me mad. I don't, that man won't bow. <laughs> now, you know, when you get mad like that, you, you sit down with your wife and you hope you have your friends. They help bring some balance, right? You got to watch who you hang around because some people can tip you, tip you over. <laughs> listen to what, listen to this good advice his wife gave in verse 14. Look close now. The wife said, calm down. Honey, don't, don't act like that. You got to think about this. This is not necessary. You don't need to kill a man over that just because he won't bow to you. Everybody else is bowing. It's just move on. Just move on. You're a millionaire. You're rich. You got, you got everything you want in life. Isn't that what she said? No, that's not what she said. The wife, Jairus, and all his friends said, let a gallows be made 50 cubits high in the morning. In the morning. Against the, uh, I suggest to the king that Mordecai be hanged on it. Hang him. That's what I think you ought to do, baby. Hang him. See, you got to be careful. You got a gang banging wife. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> got a grip. Oh, wife. Got some gang bang. She's a gang bang. And his friends. That's right. Hang him. You know, some of you got those people in your family. You know what I'm saying? You don't need to get their advice. <laughs> so that's what they tell him. Now, this is so important because of the rest of the story. This is crucial. Remember what I just said. Who told him to hang the man his wife whose idea was it his what his wife and friends they told him to do it so he does it hang him ah. but please note she is not a stopper she's an encourager his friends 
started him on this road. They were the ones who told him in chapter 3, verse 4, you know he's not bowing. Haman would have never noticed it. You know, I got into a fight one time. True story. Third grade. I remember like yesterday. True story. Me and a guy named Lee got into a big fight. You see, we was on the playground doing recess. Y'all remember recess? We don't have that now. You know, recess used to go out and play. You know, that was a little break time to play. So we was out there, and Lee, we were friends, you know, and Lee bumped into me. We bumped into, I don't know how he bumped in some kind of, anyway, uh, some guy who was with us, I kind of remember his face. I need to pray for him. <laughs> you know what he said? He said, you going to take that? You need to fight him. That's what he said. He said, fight him. I said, well, we just bumped into each other. He said, you going to take that? And his friend, his friend said, we ain't going to take that. We'll fight you. Now, we got a fight plan already after school. <laughs> oh, me and Lee just looking at each other. We, we ain't even, we didn't plan the fight. They, they coordinating the fight. I remember where the spot was, 52nd off who, but I remember the day where the fight was. I remember where I was standing. It was right there was by the trash can. We're going to fight, fight, by the trash I remember that. By a big old wooden wall. So we, after school, I'm stupid enough to go there, after school, <laughs> me and Lee and the two fools who invited us to fight. They standing back watching, refereeing. Now, me and Lee don't want to fight, so we just kind of, you know, <laughs> that's the truth. I'm not making this up. We just, you know, we don't want to fight, you know. <laughs> that's what we do it, right? And, and, and I'm just standing there, and then I'm trying to say, what, what, what are we doing this for? And before I knew it, Lee went, pow, hit me in the eye. True story, black eye. And I just said, this is stupid, and I left. Well, I got a black eye now. It's too late. I should have left earlier. I shouldn't have gone to the dumb fight. I go home, and if I, my mom looked and said, what happened to you? I said, I don't know. It's the dumb thing. Me and Lee, we good. I mean, this is crazy. Over nothing. Somebody said, did you lose the fight? We both lost the fight. It was dumb. Sometimes you both do something that makes no sense. Because there's nobody in your life. Who's encouraging you to do stuff that doesn't make sense to you? Who in your life is dragging you into behaviors that you don't even believe in? You never did this stuff. You never said these things. You never went those places. You go on places you don't even like to be with them. Really? Goodbye. Why am I in this place with these people? Amazing. The impact of this is amazing. The impact of Haman's priorities on his personal life was amazing. Three things happened that's astonishing. First of all, please notice that Haman's priorities blinded him. Can you say that with me, please? Come on. Haman's priorities blinded him. Say it again. Come on. Haman's priorities blinded him. Chapter 6, verse 6. So Haman came in. And the king asked him, what shall be done? What shall be done for the man who the king delights in? Pause. The king is standing around one day with nothing to do. And the king decides to go look at the history book, the big book they used to have. And in the book they had these stories, stories of great things that happened in the kingdom. So the king's reading and he said, oh, there's a story about this guy who saved the king. So he's intrigued. So he keeps reading. There were two guys who were plotting against the king to kill him. And these two guys, in their efforts to plot against the king, they were was reported to Queen Esther by a guy named Mordecai. And they caught the two guys, found out it was true, executed the two guys, but no one rewarded this guy named Mordecai. So when he reads it in the book, he goes, oh, my God, this guy saved my life. And he says, uh, excuse me, is there anybody here? Anybody here? And he says, yeah, well, Haman's out there walking around. So he said, get him in here. Haman, I got to ask you a question. I just read something that just touched me. I want to ask you a question. So you what he said. He said, what shall be done for the man whom the king delights in? To honor. Now Haman thought in his heart, hmm, whom should the king delight to honor more than me? Everybody say blinded. blinded. <laughs> He's blinded by his pride and his priorities. 
He's blinded in his life. He can't see where he's at. Let me tell you something. Listen to me carefully. This is important. When if your priorities are off, if your thinking's off, you can't see. You're about to be fired, and you think you're going to be hired. <laughs> <laughs> you, can't, you can't see. You don't understand. You are at the end of this relationship. You're at the end. This is the last day. I like that country song when they say a little bit, little bit too late. Something like that. It's funny. It's a funny song. And, it, it is, and the guy, he, he said he thought it was okay. It wasn't, and, and she's moving out. Sometimes in your life, you can't see. He's sitting there saying, oh, he must be talking about me. Watch what happened. This is amazing. Verse 7. Haman answered the king, oh, <laughs> so he's talking about me. Uh, For the man whom the king delights to honor, let a royal robe be brought which the king has worn and a horse on which the king has ridden, which, which has a royal crest placed on his head. And then let, verse 9, let this robe and horse be delivered uh, to the hand of the one of the king's most noble princesses that he may array the man whom the king delights to honor. Then parade him on horseback through the city square and proclaim before him, thus shall it be done. Read this with me, please. Come on. Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Now, he didn't ask for money because he got plenty of money. He didn't ask for position because he got plenty of position. He just wants a day in the sun. So the king says these words to him, verse 16, verse 10, rather. The king said to Haman, chapter 6, verse 10, hurry, take the robe and the horse as you suggested, and do so for Mordecai, the Jew. Who sits at the king's gate? He said, yeah, I know where he at. I know exactly. He always at the gate. I know exactly. I drive by there. He won't bow. I know exactly where he parked at. Every day I see him, he won't bow. <laughs> oh, boy. Verse, leave nothing undone of all that you've spoken. Verse 11, so Haman took the robe. Give me that whole robe. Give me the horse. And raid Mordecai. Give me Mordecai. Stand still. Here, put this on. And... Uh, and, and let, let it lead, lead him. Let him on a horseback through the city square. Now, you know how people talk. You know everybody said, did you see him? <laughs> you saw him? <laughs> you saw him? Hey, did you see him? I'm not lying to him. Come to watch. He, look at him. He, he walked in with a horse, man. I'm telling you. <laughs> and he proclaimed before him, thou shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Now, watch this now. I, I've learned something that's very true. If your priorities are off, you'll eventually be embarrassed. At some point, now watch what happens. This is amazing. Verse 12. Afterward, afterward, say afterward, Mordecai went back to the king's gate. But Haman hurried, he hurried to his house, mourning with his head covered. Oh, screaming. Verse 13. And when Haman told his wife, Zeresh, baby, I didn't talk to you. Bring all the friends in, all the friends. Everybody came over. That happened, told him what happened to him, told his wise men and his wife, Zeresh, listen carefully, his wife, Zeresh, what is she said to him? If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of Jewish descent, you will not prevail against him, but will surely fall before him. Pause. Uh, what'd you say, girl? <laughs> you the one told me to hang him. What you talking about? <laughs> You told me, and all of y'all told me to hang him. I don't know what, what kind of advice is this. You ever had people tell you to do something that they don't know? They told you. Leave that job. Tell those people, cuss them out, and let them know you'll find another job. Now, you, they did it. They cussed the people out, left the job, and now they need $500 to pay their rent. And now, I don't have no $500. I ain't got no $500. I ain't got no $500. This is you told me to cuss. I did that. No, I know, but I didn't tell you I had $500. I don't know why you know. You can't live with me. No, you, you, you better go back to your mama's house and cousin somebody, your children, but you can't come stay with me. They told you. He told you, baby, I love you. I love you, right? Tonight's the night. And then he, he can't he even answer the cell phone. <laughs> you say, I got a nine-month problem here. I need you to call me back. No answer. You know, you know he can hear because the voicemail say, uh, this phone is disconnected. No, that's a lie. That phone is not disconnected. All of a sudden, people who tell you stuff and lead you into behaviors and then abandon you, 
when the crisis comes. Now, this is important. Verse 14 is key. You got to watch this. This is important. Verse 14. While they were still talking. Say that with me, please. Come on. While, they were still talking. While his wife and his friends is telling him, you're going to lose, you're in trouble, you shouldn't have done this. While they were still talking, the Bible says this. The king's eunuchs came and, her, and hastened to bring him, bring Haman to the banquet. Remember the banquet? With Esther. You see, Esther had a problem. Now, he can't, now I want to say this to you. Haman's about to have a problem. Haman's, he, he's reeling, man. His head's spinning. Families told me this is a bad idea. They led me into this mess. Now I'm by myself. That's why you need your own priorities. Sometimes you need to get by yourself. Decide what you want for your life. Because when you get in trouble, standing before the judge, whatever it is, you're by yourself. And so Haman's on the way to the party. Now Esther set up this party because she had a problem. All the Jews, her people, were about to be killed on the 13th day of Adar. And Mordecai sent her a note and said, hey, listen, let me tell you something, girl. You need to go to the king and say something because this, this guy Haman's going to get everybody killed on the 13th of Adar, and we don't, you know, time is running out. You don't have all day. You need to do something. And she said, huh, I ain't, I, you know the rules. If I go to the king and it's not time, you know, uh, he, they, they kill you. Now, she hadn't seen her husband in 30 days. Now, this is a bad marriage. I know somebody said, you tell your husband, it won't be like that in our relationship. But it's 30 days she hadn't seen him, and she had to wait because the rule was, the law was, if you go in front of the king and he don't extend his arm, pop, they kill you right on the spot. No questions asked, queen or not. So she's praying. I don't know about that decision. And he tells her, he said, listen, Mordecai, you know, you know how daddy can talk to you. You know, you're a Jew too, you know. They're going to find out about you. <laughs> so you need to find the strength to go over there, girl. That's a daddy talking to you, you know. I, I love being a daddy because ain't nothing like a daddy talking to his girl. I'm going to tell you right now. Ain't nothing like it. Nothing like it. Nothing like it. I'm not your mama. I'm your daddy. Let me talk to you, girl. <laughs> Girlfriend, come here. Come here. Come here. Christina, tell you. I like it. Daddy, daddy talk. Let's have a daddy conversation. And in that moment, oh, boy, chapter 4, verse 15, watch what she does. Esther made a decision to risk her life, and she goes to the king. But she does something first. Esther told them, chapter 4, verse 15, to reply to Mordecai, go therefore, go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and first and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days. My maids are going to join in. We're going to all fast. We're going to all pray. And if I perish after I've prayed, if I've asked God, if I perish, I perish. I am not going to go until I pray. I am not going to go without God's help. But if I do what God tells me to do and I die, I die. I love it. Come on, say amen. amen. That's called commitment. Come on, amen. Are you hearing me? You see, you can't say that. If I stay single, I stay single. Uh-oh. If I don't ever have another intimate experience in my life sexually, it's okay. If I obey God, I'm not. If I perish, I perish. I will not. compromise. I'm standing before the king. She goes before the king, the king sees her, and the king looks at her. Hey, girl. I'm paraphrasing that. <laughs> Come on up here. And she said, what can I do for you half, half my kingdom? Tell me what you want. What you want from me? All I want you to do is come to a, a party. I'm having a banquet. And I want you to come. And by the way, would you bring Haman with you? That's all she wanted. Now, in the end, she adjusted her priorities for her own safety and took a chance and told the king. And the results are amazing. But that's next week. And the question next week is, did you get what you wanted? Now, Haman didn't get what he wanted. But let's talk about why. Let's look at your current results in your life and talk about why. Next week, 
I promise you, you don't want to miss the close. Can we pray? Amen. Father, I thank you today in Jesus' name. I thank you for this study. I pray it's helped and lifted the lives and hearts of your people. All that we've talked about today, I pray it brings life and vitality to them. I pray in the name of Jesus that they would see themselves in the story. They would say, who has led me to a place I wouldn't be? What am I that angry about that I'm infecting other people with? I'm mad with their daddy, so now I want my kids to be mad with their daddy. I'm mad with my mama, so I want my kids. I want everybody to feel the way I feel about everybody. I have spread this. I need to pause and see, am I running out of time? Is there something I need to adjust today? Because I don't have forever. <coughs> Haman put himself in a bad place for a foolish reason. <coughs> Am I putting myself in a bad place on this job for a foolish reason? I don't like the policy for reports, so I'm going to lose my job and this income because I don't want to fill out a few pieces of paper. Really? I'm that rich that I can afford that. Really? I don't like my supervisor, so I'm going to retire. And I know I can't afford to leave here. Really? I need to pause for a minute. I'm going to throw my marriage away. Because they're not perfect. I didn't say that they're abusive and they're harming you and danger. I get it. <coughs> but he's not handsome enough lips too big now some reason that doesn't make sense she's not the same size when I married her no she didn't have all your children and everything so now pause for a minute are you Haman are you Mordecai egging on a fight that ends up affecting a whole bunch of people because you won't bow your pride. Oh, he's a part of this story. All they had to do is bow. All they had to do is say, I'm sorry. Instead, all this happens. The bigger fault was Haman because he's the leader. Sometimes you're not the biggest reason why this family is in strife, but you had a part in it. You could have let that go. You could have said, that's not worth this kind of tension. She put my blouse on. She always wearing my clothes. Well, buy some more. I'm not going to let her use me. Okay, well, let's fight and go to jail over it. Really? Let's let hatred reign in the family over a blouse. Really? No, it's the principle. Really? Is it the principle? One day you won't be there. One day your blouses will be in another house. Don't, don't, don't let these things destroy you. Haman and Mordecai teach us something powerful about how some things should be stopped before it goes any further. Father, I pray today for everyone in this room. Hands lifted, please. We surrender our anger to you. We surrender our righteous position to you. We surrender, oh God, and pray for you to redeem our families and remove this unnecessary cloud that's going to infect everybody we love. I pray in Jesus' name for this country, how the cloud of tension that exists heal us as a nation. It's unhealthy at every level. We don't need to feel this way about each other. We don't need to be this suspicious of each other. I declare in Jesus' name healing in our country, healing in our politics, healing in our communities, healing between races. Our past is painful, but our future could be bright. In Jesus' name. Every hand down, every head bowed for a minute. If you're here today and you say, Pastor Rick, I have a need in my life. My priority should be my walk with God. And it hasn't been. I want you to pray for me because I need to make that decision. I know what you said today 
spoke to a lot of different issues. But I want you to pray for me. If you're here today and you say, pray for me, Pastor Rick, because I need, a, I need to start a walk with God today. What you've said today helped me see that. My priorities have been off. And I want to put my priorities in the right place. With every head bowed for your privacy, simply raise your hand. And that's simply you saying, pray for me. I see one. I see two. I see three, four, five. Let me see where you are. Six, seven, plus. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Father, we pray for these who raise their hands and some have raised their hearts. May this be the moment they say, Jesus, come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. Let this be the day that I surrender my life to you. You are my priority. You come first. And I want you to be the Lord of my life from this day forward. In Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. amen. Now look this way. If you, pray, you raise your hand or you raise your heart.